Hi, and welcome to this edition of Sojourners Along the Way. I'm Patricia Ercolino, the host and producer, and I am very, very, very thankful to have this visitor that I have today. This is a person I have been trying to get to come on to this program for a long time. Actually, he's appeared on Sojourners Along the Way because I've used some clips from classes that he has done. I've mentioned his name on the program before, but this is the first time that he is actually here in the studio. I hope you will enjoy our discussion. My guest is Dr. Drozak, who is a DO, and he is the author, one of the authors of an, a, um, an article that was written in the Journal of American Osteopathic Association, February 2016. And it is possible, Dr. Drozek thinks it's possible, that you can find that on the internet if you go to their website, which is really easy. You don't have to worry about spelling. It's J-A-O-A dot org. And the author of that, one of the authors of that of this particular um, article is sitting right next to me. I'm going to give you the title of that and a little bit about Dr. Drozak, someone that I am extremely thankful that Athens has here in our area. The title of Dr. Drozak and the other author's um, article is called The Effectiveness of the Complete Health Improvement Program, otherwise known as CHIP, that's my addition, in reducing risk factors for cardiovascular disease in an Appalachian population. Dr. Drozak is a DO, and he's with the Department of Speciality Medicine at Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine in Athens, Ohio. Dr. Drozak was a Complete Health Improvement Program facilitator for Class 5 and a member of the Live Healthy Appalachia Complete Health Improvement Program leadership team. So Dr. Drozak, I am very, very thankful that you are here. And if you would start to give us some of the information that we can find in this article, tell people why this is so important. What do they need to know? Thank you, Patricia, for inviting me. Oh. It's great to be here. I'm excited to be here and to be able to share this information. Mm -hmm. uh, the CHIP program, the Complete Health Improvement Program, is really important to our community because it's providing some tools to many people who would like to get well, find out how to deal with their chronic lifestyle diseases, as well as many people who would like to learn how to prevent many of the common diseases like, like uh, diabetes and cancer and uh, heart disease. And we have a lot of those tools right there built into the program. Okay. The basis of the program um, is lifestyle medicine. It's a new specialty in medicine and, like, and the CHIP program is one tool of that. Focuses on diet or nutrition, basically what we eat. It focuses on a plant-based whole food program. A diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes such as beans, peas, and lentils, as well as some nuts and seeds. Uh, it also focuses on activity, not necessarily exercise, but many of us need to have a, a programmed exercise um, time into our lives because we're too sedentary. But many people like farmers are, are pretty busy and don't need to have a specific time for exercise because they're doing it as part of their activity, uh, as part of their, part of their work. But that's important as well. And the third main area that we deal with in lifestyle medicine is stress management. We all have way too much stress in our lives. Some stress is important to motivate us to get out of bed to do what we need to do, but too much stress can have some very negative impacts on our, our health. Um, so we deal with those as well as mentioning some unhealthy habits such mm -hmm. as tobacco. So I'm we, sorry. That's all right. I, that, does, that causes me to laugh for several reasons, but one, I was and I am an ex-smoker mm -hmm. and I am very thankful that I am an ex-smoker because you know, I was one of the typical Americans who thought I was invincible. That happens mm -hmm. to everybody else, but not me. Mm -hmm. 
until I saw the x-ray mm -hmm. and asked my doctor, what's that spot? And was told the question, do you smoke? Mm -hmm. And right on that spot, I said, not anymore. Um, so I am an advocate for not smoking. I'm going to look at the um, abstract and give our, our audience some information <clears throat> about the article that there are 11 counties in Appalachian, Ohio, self-reported prevalence of diabetes in our area, in the Athens County region, is higher than the entire state of Ohio. That the direct medical costs for diabetes in the United States are estimated at $176 billion annually. That was billion. That's just one disease in the United States. The indirect costs from disability, work loss, and premature death add up to another $69 billion. So we're talking that this particular disease is over $230 billion. And when you consider that it can be a factor in the cause of death, and it doesn't have to be. This is some of the information from this article. I hope you will take advantage of going to jaoa.org so you can read this information at your leisure. And remember, it is in a medical um, journal, so some of it is a little bit on the technical side, but it is readable, okay? And I hope it will be an encouragement to our viewing audience. Later, I'm going to ask Dr. Drozak to talk a little bit about his program and how he went to a lifestyle practice, and that's what he wants to do. I don't know if I should really call it a practice, though, should I? It is. It's a lifestyle medicine practice. Okay. Yes. All right. I want to promote that. I have in other programs. Now you have the man right here and to tell us what it is about the results. Um, there were six CHIP programs that were done that you used in your study. In the study. In the mm -hmm. study. There mm -hmm. have been a lot more. Over 20 at this point. Yes. At this recording, there have been over 20. Hopefully by the time you view this, a few years from now, there will be a lot more. Please, I'm a big advocate for lifestyle medicine and doing whatever you can to get healthy. And that's what this is all about. So this study was done in Appalachian, Ohio region from 2011 to 2012. Right now we're at 2016. So you probably would find some of the t statistics that will have changed. Yes, I'd like to highlight that a little bit if I can. Sure. Uh, at the time this article was submitted, we were using the statistics that you read. Uh, the predictions were um, that by the year 2020, half of our population mm. would have diabetes or pre-diabetes. Well, in America, we tend to excel in lots of things, so we're no. way ahead of that. No. Looking at the data that was compiled from 2012, we lag, we always lag in our ability to, to analyze the data, but as of 2012, we had already reached that level. So half of the population, and at this point, probably well beyond that, but again, the data lags several years before we can analyze it. So right now, nationwide, better than half our population has diabetes or prediabetes, um, and in this area in particular, we're in the, one of the highest zones in the country, so it's far beyond that. And the very alarming aspect of that is a very large percentage of people don't even know it. Hmm. So it's important to be evaluated, to be checked routinely, uh, especially if you have any symptoms. The symptoms of diabetes in particular are excess thirst, excess urination, um, weight gain uh, usually is associated with, with uh, diabetes. It's one of those chronic illnesses that we struggle with. Um, when you put on the excess weight, it increases your risk for diabetes. Uh, some people that have very uncontrolled diabetes will actually lose weight. Hmm. Um, that tends to be more with the type 1 diabetes, the ju what we used to call juvenile onset. But you can see that as well in somebody who's very sick from uh, even type 2 diabetes. Can you go a little bit further into 
what's the difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes? To me, that kind of sounds like it's being a little bit pregnant. Like, and no, right. you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. How is it you can be pre-diabetes? Well, we look at uh, the fasting blood sugars to give us the initial idea of what that is. And the definitions have changed over the years, and they may still be changing some more. But uh, generally, we look at a fasting blood sugar. So you haven't had anything to eat. You go into the laboratory, have your blood work done. And if you have a, blood or a fasting blood count or blood glucose level of less than 100, that's normal. Hmm. If it's between 100 and 125, that is high and probably in that pre-diabetes range. If it's over 125, then that moves into the diabetes range. We do other tests to confirm that. There's a test called hemoglobin A1C, which we also do that gives us a, a better idea of what the blood sugars have been averaging over the last three months or so. And there's some other tests that we can do as well to help us diagnose diabetes. So our blood is a tattletale on us. It but is indeed. But in this case, it is a very good one because it can help us. So viewing audience, please, if you are concerned about your health, if you want to learn, ask your doctor about getting some blood tests. Is it okay if I say these things? I'm sure. talking to a DO, so I want to pick your brain and give our viewing audience information because we probably have some people that uh, don't like to go to the doctor, mm -hmm. but hopefully through this program and learning about this journal uh, article, you'll say, maybe I should have this checked out, especially, especially if you are in southeastern Ohio. You heard what was just said. We have the highest rate. You know, I'm proud of Athens, Ohio, and I love us to be first in things, but this is not one of the things I want us to be first in. I want us to be last in this, and it is possible right here in Athens County. The impetus for this article was the CHIP program. And you have done more in your own program, the Lifestyle Clinic. Um, and I, I want people to have that information. Mm -hmm. So what is in this article that you, here, I'm, I'm looking at these words, cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, stroke, mm -hmm. limb, amputation, microvascular complication, neuropathy, and I'm going to ask you, to tell us what these words mean, and I didn't finish the whole list, so would you please? Sure. One of the, uh, or some of the things that we worry about, about diabetes in particular, are the things that it causes in the body. People rarely die of just diabetes. It's the end effects of what diabetes does. For example, diabetes accelerates the risk of heart disease. Basically, if you have diabetes, you probably have heart disease. They're equivalent uh, in our thinking that's an automatic risk factor for heart disease if you have diabetes. Diabetes also causes clogging not only of the arteries of the heart, which is the heart disease that, that we're talking about, it also causes clogging of the arteries in the eyes, hmm. which can lead to blindness, uh, clogging of the arteries in the kidneys, which can lead to kidney failure and dialysis. Many people on dialysis are on dialysis because of uncontrolled diabetes. It also can cause clogging of the arteries that feed the rest of the body, such as the toes and the legs, and that's why it's common for people with uncontrolled diabetes to need amputations to remove their toes and their feet and sometimes their legs. And other organs of the body also suffer because of lack of blood flow that's associated with diabetes. Okay. Now, um, I wanted to back up a little bit and say that the CHIP program and also the Lifestyle Clinic is not just for people with diabetes, correct? correct. Would you elaborate upon that? Because that also is touched on in this article. Sure. Correct? Yeah. Lifestyle medicine, the principles in lifestyle medicine apply to everybody. For people who are healthy, it will keep you, help keep you healthy, uh, allow you to have the optimal lifestyle, the optimal life span or health span. We talk about living as long as possible, as healthy as possible. Because yes. we don't, and that's the problem with diabetes. 
uh, once you, you are diagnosed with diabetes, it tends to cause a slow, long decline where people become spectators of life rather than mm. participants of life. So we want people to be healthy, active participants having a healthy lifespan, not just living, but, part, uh, but actually participating in life. Um, so it's basically for everybody. Some of the initial studies that were done with lifestyle medicine have shown the power of a healthy diet to actually reverse heart disease. They actually open up clogged arteries. Dean Ornish, many years ago, uh, showed that in some studies. Uh, even before that, the Pritikin program, which um, is similar, uh, was able to reverse heart disease in people. And then more recently than that up at Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Esselstyn has been able to repeat that same hmm. type of information by taking people with um, bad hearts, end-stage heart disease, and turning them around and making them healthy people again. Would you repeat that? I want you to hear what he just said, okay? This is, this is medically done, or with, I'll say with the medical field, but it's also documented, correct? Oh, definitely. We have x-ray proof of clogged arteries opening up uh, after people change their diets, increase their activity, manage their stress, people get well. Okay. One of the studies that got my attention, uh, my own story was about five, well, a little bit more than five years ago. I hit my 50s, went to my primary care doc, um, found out to my surprise that I was in that pre-diabetes category. I thought I was well, my cholesterol was high and my blood pressure was high. I was a little overweight, I knew that, and I had heartburn, I knew that, but I wasn't aware of those other things. Mm. So he did what doctors generally do, is he wrote me prescriptions, didn't say anything about diet or exercise, said, come on back in three months, I'll probably give you another pill. So I started taking the medicine and uh, quickly had side effects. Mm. That I've seen that again and again in many of our patients. Uh, the side effects that occur from these medicines, but I did not want to have diabetes. I take care of enough people with diabetes and have seen that long, uh, sad decline in health over years. So I was, I was determined. I was going to do whatever it, it required. I started a Mediterranean diet because I'd heard that was good. Um, hadn't read that much on it. Hadn't been taught that much on it in medical school. And I lost about five pounds and thought things were going to be better. I got rid of my, uh, my afternoon, um, I won't say the brand name. <laughs> okay. I was Very warned good. not to use the Very brand good. name. Yeah, we uh, don't do commercials. But I, have a, uh, I was having an afternoon soda and candy bar, which oh I eliminated oh and boy. lost five pounds. Uh, just by, and wait I, a minute, I want to point that out. Just by eliminating that one carbonated drink and the candy bar. And changing my diet slightly, slightly. we all already had been eating lots of fruits and vegetables and plants in our diet, but okay. we were eating a fair bit of meat and a fair bit of cheese, and well, we decreased a little of that, and uh, I lost five pounds. I think that's tremendous, and I want to put a plug in. Little changes can make big differences. But, that's a Karen Bailey. Yes, but it wasn't the right diet. Okay. And when I went back to the doctor expecting good results, diabetes was progressing. Oh, not good. So, and again, I thought I was doing the right thing using the Mediterranean diet, okay. which is out there as a, and promoted as a popular diet, but it wasn't enough. I, the diabetes was progressing. So at that point I felt, well, this is the way it's going to be. Mm. I'm going to end up with diabetes before the decade was out. Uh, and then my wife went to the first Appalachian Health Summit in May 2011, and that was the turning point for me, and she heard Dr. Esselstyn from Cleveland uh. Clinic. He was talking about his study, which uh, is highlighted in the documentary Forks Over Knives, which I would highly recommend for everybody. Uh, it's a, it can be a life changer. Can you um, repeat that name, please? Forks Over Knives. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn is okay. featured in there with many of his patients. He took 20-some patients from Cleveland Clinic. They had end-stage heart disease. Mm. Cleveland Clinic had done all their bypasses and stents and said, there's nothing else we can do for you. Uh, go home, take your medicine. You have about one to two years to live. Make the most of it. 
So Dr. Esselstyn invited them in to a program where he put them on a plant-based, whole food, low-fat diet. 20 years later, all of those patients, except one, were alive and well. Now, let, let's, let's, let's highlight that. You said that all these patients, and they were under medical care, were told they had one to two years expe life expectancy. Correct. And then you said 20 years later. They're alive and well. They're alive and well, with the exception of one person. He dropped out of the study after six months and promptly died. Oh, wow. Oh, so wow. So those who stuck with the program 20 years later were alive and well, and many of them are featured in the documentary Forks Over Knives. So it's highly recommended. So I, I listened to Dr. Esselstyn, and he held up the x-rays of some of their arteries. Here they were when they started, all clogged damaged, and then a year later, those arteries had opened up. The blood flow had returned to the heart. The body was healing itself mm. when given the right tools. Uh, that got my attention. I'd never been taught this in medical school. So I was very curious. And he said, by the way, their diabetes got better, their blood pressure got better, their cholesterol got better, they lost weight, they got well. So it was very intriguing because I was ready. I was disappointed. I was trying what I knew was the thing to do or what I thought was the thing to do and I wasn't getting better. Mm -hmm. So then I started reading things like the China study, which is also featured in Forks Over Knives and the Adventist Health Studies. And I realized there's real power in a plant-based whole food diet. For, for our audience that may not be familiar with the Adventist study, would you give the full name of the group you're referring to, please? Well, it's a study that focuses on uh, the Seventh-day Adventists. Predominantly, the study initially was focused in Loma Linda, California, where there's a large population of uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, which is a religious group. Right. Uh, they live a very healthy life. Actually, a tangent onto that is um, there is this concept called the blue zones, yes, yes. where people around the world who live in these blue zones live the longest and the healthiest. And the only one in the United States is that in Loma Linda, the, the Seventh-day Adventist community. They eat a predominantly plant-based diet because they follow the dietary laws and the original diet in the Garden of Eden, which is plant-based. Mm -hmm. So they promote that through their church. They also do regular exercise. It's part of their process. They take nature walks on the Sabbath and the, and the weekends, and they encourage activity. Um, they do not generally drink alcohol. They generally do not use tobacco. So that eliminates those factors, which oftentimes confuse the results of other studies, sort of like our study. Some of these people may have been smoking and using mm. alcohol. So that's another factor that can affect health as well. But in the Adventist study, it was minimized. And uh, these people who were eating the plant-based diet did the best in all the health outcomes that were studied, such as heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. They did well. That study got my attention. It convinced me. My wife was already ready, so we went to a plant-based whole food diet. Rapidly, I got well. Wow. Within a couple of weeks, the blood pressure was normal. My blood sugar, when I checked it again, about three months later, was down in the normal range. The hemoglobin A1C that was elevated, reversed, and was moving toward normal. I'd stopped my medication, so they were no longer a factor. You and were my, on doctor's care, though, because I don't want people thinking it's okay for uh, you to stop medication. Doctors aren't good patients. <laughs> uh, don't do what I did. Do what uh, your doctor no. I, I just stopped my medicine. But he is uh, a doctor. And uh, yes, but yeah. Do it with your doctor's guidance. But I stopped my medicine and my cholesterol stayed in the normal range. It was in the normal range with the statin medication, but I was having muscle cramping with that. Mm. So I was ready to get rid of the statin, so I stopped it. And the, the cholesterol levels stayed in the normal range. Uh, nearly 50% decrease in my LDL, the bad cholesterol that we worry about. And it stayed there. Uh, it stayed in a very healthy range since. 
and I lost 30 pounds wow. over the next three years. It wow. wasn't a rapid weight loss. I lost 10, 10 more pounds fairly quickly, but it continued to decrease slowly over the next several years until I got to an ideal body weight. Now it fluctuates depending on the season and my activity level, about five pounds up okay. and down. So that's, that was my initial introduction into lifestyle medicine as a patient. Then I became very interested and said, this needs to be taught to my patients, but I didn't know anything about it other than what I had just learned as being a patient. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into it and very fortunately for us here in Athens, Live Healthy Appalachia was sponsoring the Complete Health Improvement Program. My wife and I went to the training to become facilitators, learned a whole lot more about this, and then began helping teach or facilitate the class for other people. And I began to see many of the people in the classes who said, I want to do this and embrace the changes. They as well got well. And as I watched this happen, that led to my first study when we looked at the same group of patients that we report in this article, we looked at the 220 some patients who went through the class, the first six classes, and we looked at their data and many of them were having very significant improvements in blood pressure, weight, um, cholesterol, um, those factors that we look at in there to see what happened. And in this study that we're talking about today, we're looking particularly at people who had elevated blood sugars, either in that pre-diabetes level or that diabetes level. And when we look at the data statistically with, with the statistical analysis, we saw that we had significant improvements in blood pressure, mm -hmm. in weight, in blood <laughs> sugars, and in cholesterol in the patients who participated. Now that's not to say there's some people who didn't have improvements. That's what statistics does. It takes a group of these patients, and in this study we have 110 patients. Okay. So when you group them all together and you average their changes, you see as an average there is improvement in all of those categories. Individuals may not improve in a specific category, and some individuals may not improve, improve in any. And having taught the class and been through it, I know there's some people that sit there that really aren't making the changes. And they'll tell you, and they're there, maybe because their spouse brought them a little bit reluctantly, or because they're not really ready to make all the changes, which makes this all the more interesting that even people averaged in here who aren't making all the changes we're encouraging them to make, on the average, there's significant improvement in these parameters, which we would project and suspect that then are going to lead to better health Mm. in the long run. Yeah. And I do want to emphasize, because the word diabetes is mentioned through, has been mentioned quite a bit, but you don't have to have diabetes to benefit from what is written in this article. It is a complete health improvement program, CHIP, otherwise known as CHIP, and there is so much to benefit from. Um, I'd like you to, you know, elaborate upon some of your other findings that you have in here. Some of the things that you were done, because there were, you had six cohorts that consisted of 16, and I'm reading from the article, that there were six cohorts consisting of 16 two-hour group sessions mm -hmm. over a four to eight week period. That is the typical length of the CHIP program, is that correct? Correct. It has changed some. They have a newer version out. It's a little bit longer okay. and a little bit higher tech. It's a very nice uh, version that they have out with. Uh, it's, they're, they're all video based, but the new ones are uh, just much, much nicer, much more modern. Although I, I have a, uh, a partiality for the old ones with uh, videoed lectures being presented by Dr. Deal, the founder of the program. Uh, I, he is such a charismatic speaker. And uh, those lectures, well, they, they were my first introduction to CHIP, so I really do have a preference for those, although the new ones are very high-tech and very nice. 
So that tells you it's also very modern and keeping up with what's going on. And for those that, well, let me ask that as a question. Is it possible for someone um, that prefers like the visuals that you were just mentioning, would they have access to them if they went to the CHIP program? Um, they've been pulled off the market. The old ones okay. are supposedly not in circulation anymore. However, I do have a few copies, <laughs> and I do share them with select patients. Okay. Um, the CHIP program, for example, uh, currently costs $600. Not everybody can afford that. Right. Not everybody sees the benefit of it up front. The benefit is there. It's clear. You save more money yes. on your, your um. medication savings over time. And we don't know yet how much benefit that has over the long run when you uh, prevent and reverse many of these chronic illnesses. You know, we can't quite quantify that. We're trying to. We're doing some studies Could. on that now. Could. Uh, the nice thing about the CHIP program here in Athens, there are several employers who cover the cost for their employees. For example, Ohio University. Mm -hmm. And we have another study we are working on getting published. We're finishing up the paper on that where we are looking at the results for people who are employed at Ohio University who've been through the CHIP program, we see the same results. They have gotten, uh, they've had improvements in all of these same factors. We're also looking at their savings in healthcare spending. Mm -hmm. We don't have that information yet. We're waiting for uh, HR from Ohio University to provide us with that information, but we're excited to see it because other places like Vanderbilt University have done a study on the CHIP program there mm -hmm. with diabetics in their population and they have had the same kind of improvements as well as cost savings to their their health care program. Uh, and I, I like to make a point because some people say oh I can't afford it and it's like wait a minute you have a choice I'm into preventive and if you can see and you here's an article it is documented and extremely well documented you get that idea from how Dr. Drozak is speaking that this is not just any information being composed and put into an article. To be published in the journal, let me get the right letters, the Journal of American Association of Osteopathic, oh, sorry, let me start that again, the Journal of American Osteopathic Association. Do you think they're just going to publish any article? No, it has to be top notch. And so for them to publish this article speaks very highly of those that are the authors of it. It talks very highly of the study that was done. The point I want to make is, do you want to be pre or do you want to have to go afterwards? If you do pre-work, such as making the changes in the food, in the things in your lifestyle, that can prevent you from having to get all of those medicines. And if you are on the medicines, you can benefit from the information in this article, and you can tell Dr. Drozak is extremely knowledgeable about what he's talking about. And right here in southeastern Ohio, we, we are very fortunate. We do have the CHIP program that is offered several times during the year. And Dr. Drozak also offers his programs. He has classes that are offered throughout the year. I want to put in a plug for them because, may I say, it works. It does work. We're yeah. looking at the data. It's very similar to the CHIP program. Um, it developed out of the encouragement from our administration at Doctors Hospital. Uh, realizing this worked so well in our population, I was looking for an affordable way to get the same material to our patients who are living in poverty in the area, people who couldn't afford the CHIP program. So we l were looking for ways to do that, and the hospital administration said, why don't you develop your own curriculum? Um, realizing that's quite a task, the CHIP program's pretty involved. It was shortly after that that uh, Dr. Neil Barnard was here in Athens to do a presentation. He is one of the uh, leaders in lifestyle medicine and has done some wonderful studies to show the reversal of diabetes in patients better than the American Diabetes Association diet. He ran those two programs. His, he calls it a vegan diet, vegan low fat. I, I prefer to shy away from the term vegan. I like plant-based whole foods because vegan 
sounds faddish. <laughs> Vegan can also mean Twinkies and French fries. Really? Sure. Why? There's no animal products. Ugh. Okay. So I prefer plant-based whole food diet. Nonetheless, Dr. Bernard put people on a vegan low-fat diet. Half of the people went on that. The other half went on the American Diabetes Association diet. The people on his diet did better when they looked at their hemoglobin A1Cs and their cholesterol levels and their weight loss. They did better than the American Diabetes Association diet. So that's a, that's a tangent. But, but that's okay. And I'm going to go a step further with that because I happen <clears throat> to know that Dr. Bernard has written several books, one of which um, I would like to put a plug in, and that is The Prevention and Reversal of Diabetes. Yes. And um, highly, highly recommend this book. And, and any book written by Dr. Bernard, mm -hmm. I think you will find the information extremely helpful. I, Sojourners Along the Way, wants to help our region, our nation, to get back to good health. And it is possible. And if you look at the alternatives, choose, what do you want to choose? Do you want to, you know, do you want to eat something or do you want to have a better quality of life? And I like that term. What do you want as your quality of life? Mm -hmm. And what are some of the things in this article that will just really highlight and point out to have good quality of life. And that's where we should, yeah, we've been not yet talking about the details of right. the Go program. Right, go for it. So it's time. So a plant-based whole food diet. That's eating, um, as I encourage my patients, at least 90% of your calories coming from a plant-based whole food source. Whole food means food is grown, recognizable to your grandparents as food, not a Twinkie. Uh, something applesauce qualifies because it's mushed apples, and you can look at that and say, I know where that came from, I know what that is. So things like that. Pasta also is a whole food. It's minimally processed, but it still contains all the bran and all the all the uh, fiber that was there in the original food. So that's minimally processed and that still counts in the plant-based whole food diet. Uh, we don't necessarily encourage counting calories. The benefit is th of this is if you eat a plant-based whole food diet, you're gonna get everything you need. The fiber crowds out the excess calories, especially if you eliminate or minimize the added fats to a diet. We encourage people to get to 40 grams of fiber a day. Uh, and we do have a simple method to calculate that where they can get a sense of, am I eating enough fiber? The, the beautiful thing about this is eating that much fiber just automatically decreases your caloric intake and you lose weight slowly, gradually, half a pound, a pound and a half, maybe two pounds a week, maybe a little bit quicker initially because this is a dramatic change for a lot of us from the way we were eating. But over time, you lose weight in a sustainable way, not a yo-yo diet where you lose 20 pounds and then regain it. It's a lifestyle change. You learn, learn a new way of eating that's healthy, and you maintain that. So the diet is a plant-based, whole food diet. We have recipes. We teach you how to do it because that's foreign to a lot of people. So a big part of the program is teaching you how to do it, what it means, how to choose those foods. The second thing is the activity or exercise level. And there's two ways we measure that. One way is with a pedometer for people who can walk well, because uh, we know a lot of our people who come to our classes have trouble with their knees and hips, and a pedometer is not a good gauge for them because they can't walk that much. But people who can walk a pedometer uh, is a great way to measure the steps. And the studies have shown 10,000 steps a day is the optimal. Uh, more if, you, if you'd like, but at least 10,000 steps a day you get health benefits. So we encourage people, get a pedometer, work up to that 10,000 steps a day. If you can't walk and the pedometer is not the best way, then we encourage people to get 30 minutes of moderate exercise a day. And the nice way to just kind of gauge what is moderate exercise. That's, you're, you can walk fast or do some chair exercises, but to the point where 
you couldn't sing. You'd have to be too, you're too gaspy to sing, but you could talk to somebody, so you can do it with them. That's moderate exercise. If you can't talk and you're huffing and puffing, that's vigorous exercise, and you can actually do less time-wise duration and get the same benefit with vigorous exercise, but you want to do it with somebody because you're more likely to do it. So moderate exercise is great because you can carry on a conversation with your buddy while you're doing it. So 30 minutes a day, that can be broken up into 10-minute segments. So a 10-minute walk after each meal also helps blunt your blood sugar spikes because it gives your body some activity. It burns up some of that sugar that you've just put into it with your meals, brings that blood sugar spike down. If that blood sugar spike goes too high, it starts to cause some of the negative effects in our body, and it also gets converted to fat and put into storage, and then we gain weight. So exercise after meals is an excellent way to help combat diabetes. The third, stress management, is something that's a little less commonly practiced because it's, the, the evidence on that is fairly new, that it's coming out 12 minutes a day of deep breathing exercises or mindfulness or meditation or yoga, something along that line that controls your breathing, brings your heart rate down, brings your pulse down, has been shown through biochemical studies to make some positive changes, to decrease the risk of heart disease, to improve your health in many different ways. That's a, a, an element of many of these programs, like CHIP, like the Ornish Spectrum program, and the Pritikin program that have all been successful in reversing uh, chronic disease and heart disease. They include those three things. And then, of course, we already talked about tobacco. If you smoke, don't. <laughs> Get rid of it. And that's an interesting tool or an interesting uh, screening mechanism. If somebody's not ready to give up their tobacco, they're probably not ready to make changes in their diet. Mm. Uh, and I, that's another study I'd like to do because we have had some people that have come through the CHIP program that are tobacco users. And my sense in watching them is that they have not done as well because I think people who are unwilling, they haven't had that mental... Uh, decision, that determination to say, I'm going to get healthy. If they're not ready and willing to get rid of their tobacco, they're probably not ready to do these other changes in their life. Okay. I want to make two points. One is, if you are interested in this information, and so far, and we're not done yet, but if you are interested in the information that Dr. Drozak is giving, um, you can go on to the internet you would go to Sojourners Along the Way YouTube, and I am very thankful to YouTube because they will give you the playlist for all of the Sojourners Along the Way programs, and you will be able to find one. Dr. Drozak's name will be in the, um, the title for the program. And two, in talking about the food items and what you put in your mouth, if you are eating something in a package, I like how, and I'm trying to remember which person it was that said, I think it was Karen Bailey, said that the front of the package is the advertisement. They're trying to sell you something. If you turn it over, that's where the information we must pay attention to. And we have to realize the food industry is out there to sell their product. They don't care about health. So they will put in the least amount, you know, they have to tell us the information about how much sodium is in it, how much sugar is in it, how much protein and the other things in the labeling. Well, they don't want to have to list a lot of sugars or a lot of sodium, so they'll make the serving size relatively small. But if you look at how much sodium is in it, how much sugar is in it, and how little protein is in it, you're getting a good idea of what's going on on the inside of that package. Then you look at the list of ingredients. Now, if there are words you don't understand, you can't pronounce, why do you want to put that in your body? I have gone through a major lifestyle change because it dawned on me. I don't need to put chemicals into my body. My body doesn't know how to process them. I want the ingredient list to be as short as possible, preferably just one item, which means Maybe I don't need to buy something that has been processed. 
maybe it's better to do just the straightforward plant-based items. Healthiest foods do not have nutrition labels. They're yeah. in the produce department. Yes. yes. So that's a plug for our grocery stores. Yes. And also our specialty stores that we do have here in Athens County. Okay. Get familiar with these places. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please. We want you to be in good health. So we have approximately 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that we touch on all of the things that you would like to say about the, the article. Oh, and we don't have enough time to do all that. I'll say everything I'd like to say. <laughs> well, go That's for it. That's why our, our classes are, uh, the, the, the CHIP programs, 18 hour and a half classes. A lot of information to go over. Okay. Well, give us the highlights, please. What would you like to highlight from your article? Um, I think we've touched on the main things from the article. The, the other things I'd probably I'd like to talk about a little bit more maybe are the benefits of fiber. Oh, go for it. You know, the fiber, as we mentioned, that's only in plants. If it's in animal products, it's put in there artificially. And that's really the key to this. And fiber is more than just a filler. You know, a lot of people think, well, fiber, it's just kind of the stuff you put in there and it helps you stay regular and you can take a fiber supplement. But fiber actually is a fuel, a food source for the bacteria, the healthy bacteria that live within our intestinal tract. When we deprive them of the fiber they need, then they die and other bacteria grow that are used to eating things like animal products. They are not as healthy. They cause an inflammatory reaction in our bodies through the digestion of the animal products that we're giving them to eat. And that leads to a state of inflammation, and it's also called, called another term you may hear is oxidative stress, mm. that's causing the damage in our blood vessels that lead to heart disease and lead to autoimmune diseases. Uh, and other things that autoimmune diseases would be things like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, are very common diseases that are out there. And they respond very well to plant-based diets. There's some studies on patients with rheumatoid arthritis that you can turn their symptoms on and off by cycling back and forth between a plant-based diet and a more standard diet by just adding the animal products back in. So the fiber is essential. It decreases the caloric density because if you fill up more with fiber, you have less room for the calories because fiber has zero calories. Plus it's feeding the bacteria in our intestines that break that down into helpful, nutritious byproducts that are healthy for us. So we need to be aware of that. The other aspect about fiber, an illustration I like to use, and I think there's a visual aid that you might put on okay. there. For example, uh, to illustrate caloric density, if you get a bag of potato chips, a 30 gram bag of uh, these potato chips that you are th yeah, 30 grams, uh, the one ounce bag that you get along with your sub sandwich if you get that. And the calories in that, I think, and I, I should have had the visual in front of me for okay. this, I think it's like 190 calories. Okay. But then if you eat an apple instead, that's much more filling has only a fraction of the calories. So the apple will fill you up, satisfy you. That bag of chips is like gone and you want more. But the calories in that bag of chips, if I remember right from the, we'll, we'll put that, well, that put visual, the visual up on. there and that yeah. people can look at it. It's like eight times the calories yeah. in that bag of chips. So you eat more, you get more calories. Those extra calories that you don't need then get stored as fat. And that's the big problem. I don't like that word. I want to eliminate that word. Adipose tissue. Nah. <laughs> I don't think I want that word either. Okay. We do want to eliminate fat because it's the fat, not the sugar, that's really the driver of diabetes. Uh, there's a study done back in and the, the 30s. Is it okay? I'm, I'm the, I'm the non-medical person, mm -hmm. but it's not just diabetes, is it? It's other health factors sure. too. Correct. I mean, we have said a lot about diabetes, but for good health, for good health, plant-based is a great way to go. 
Yes. Definitely. The study back in the 30s was done in, uh, among medical students and they took a group of medical students and they fed them diets that were very high in sugar and they followed their blood sugars. Nothing happened. They took the same students and then they fed them a high fat diet for a couple of weeks. They all moved into the category of prediabetes. Wow. It's the fat that is the problem, not the sugar. The fat, if you will, kind of in lay terms, clogs up the mechanisms of dealing with sugar normally. So our sh blood sugars go up, but it's because fat has gunked up the works so that things don't work as well. So really, the ideal diet for somebody who has diabetes is a low-fat, plant-based diet. That's where we want to move to reduce the weight, to unclog the mechanisms in the body so that our body can deal with the sugar. Sugar is important. That's our main energy source in our bodies. We need it. We need it in the right quantities. And we need a body that's able to deal with it. But when you say sugar, I'm sure that many people have this visual of a bag of sugar mm -hmm. and say, Dr. Drozek just gave me permission to use more of the white granules. No, I didn't. You want to get that in the natural form as it comes in the plants. You will get all the sugar you need by eating a plant-based whole food diet, it will be natural. Now you also want to eat that in a balance. And I have people frequently who have diabetes that will come and tell me, you know, I eat this piece of fruit, my blood sugar goes way up. You need to eat it in a balanced form. Eat it with some whole grains, eat it with some beans that are high in fiber. Uh, those kind of things will then balance out that blood sugar spike, it'll keep it lower. Beans in particular have a wonderful effect. They're high in fiber. Uh, there's lots of good things about beans. Eating, for example, one can or one, one cup of beans a day for five days a week, a recent study showed it was as effective as telling somebody or as, as restricting the diet by 500 calories. If you try to restrict 500 calories from your diet, the average person's going to go a little bit hungry and not be satisfied. But if you take the other group of people and they were just told to add a cup of beans a day, don't restrict anything, they had the same benefits as those who did restrict the calories when they looked at weight loss, blood sugar control, and blood pressure control. So adding the beans in is actually helpful. So we're telling people you can actually eat more, eat the right food. You don't have to go around hungry. The other really interesting thing about beans, it has an effect in blunting the blood sugar that lasts for six hours. They call mm. it the second meal effect. So if you have, I eat beans for breakfast. Mm -hmm. I have a bowl of oatmeal with some fruit and nuts and uh, I use uh, pumpkin pie spice or cinnamon to give it a nice flavor. I don't add any sugar. It's wonderful. It doesn't need any sugar. It's plenty sweet enough from the spices and the fruit that I put on it. I also have about a half a cup of beans in the morning that helps control my blood sugar. Now, my blood sugars have been normal, but they were normal after I switched to that type of a diet. So I don't know how much that plays a role in it, but beans are healthy. I eat them for breakfast pretty much every day. Um, and they get that nice effect. So you can do it. You can have any kind of beans does the same thing. It can be refried beans, low fat refried beans. Ideally do your own. Uh, do them in a blender, don't add any fat. So they're, they're a great power food in that respect. The other thing we'll mention about beans is they're high in protein. A lot of people are worried about getting enough protein in their diet. And for most people they think meat is protein. Well, meat in most cases has more fat in it than protein. But if you eat a plant-based whole food diet that's balanced, including whole grains and beans and fruits and vegetables, you will get all the protein you need. The studies have really shown that less protein is better than more protein. And then people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build muscle and everything and I need to have that protein supplement. No, you don't. There's many 
vegan athletes out there. And I have a web page that features, there's, a, there's a, a tab on athletes, and you can go there and read their stories. There's many vegan athletes out there, totally plant-based, get no uh, animal protein in their diet at all. And many of them are Olympic athletes, Very competitors good. at that level. We have approximately five minutes left, and I want to make sure that people hear you say your contact information, please. Okay. Uh, several ways to get a hold of me. Probably the best is via the email for my Lifestyle Medicine Clinic, the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic, TLMC at OhioHealth.com. That's probably the best way to get me. Or if it's easier to remember, Drozek, my last name, D-R-O-Z-E-K, at Ohio.edu. Either way, um, people can get a hold of me. And if they wanted to call your office to see about participating in a class, how would they do that? They can do that as well by um, looking at my website. Again, t, uh, the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic dot us. Uh, we'll get you there. All that contact information is right there. Okay. I hope you feel the way that I do, that we have just had the opportunity to sit at the feet of a DO for free. And you have the opportunity to get all this information. I know Dr. Drozak wants to help people to live healthy and to have a good, healthy lifestyle. Is there one parting word you would like to give us? Maybe a, a slight promotion for my own clinic that I developed. Sure. Uh, we have many people in the community who can't afford to go to CHIP or don't see the need of paying that. There's another alternative, and that's the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic that we're doing through my clinic at Ohio Health. And uh, people can come there. We charge it to insurance. And we also offer many free community programs through the hospital. Uh, they're all listed on our website. So there's opportunities. We do Wellness Wednesday, fourth Wednesday of every month. We won't be doing it in the summer, but we're doing that now. People can uh, come, get a free meal, get two-hour session. That's representative of things that you would learn in the CHIP program or in my other classes. And the hospital that Dr. Drozak is referring to is Oblenis Hospital, Ohio Health Oblenis Hospital. I hope you will take advantage of all of this information. We want to have good health. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Sojourners Along the Way. And thank you so very much. Thank Patricia, you. Patricia, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.